Welcome to Utah State University in Logan, Utah. Located in the Western United States, Utah is the second driest of the 50 states and has an annual average precipitation of less than 12 inches. It's also located on the eastern edge of the Great Basin, one of the great deserts of the world. The Western US is generally defined by its arid climate, but water can be highly variable from year to year and place to place. This year's devastating drought in California, wildfires in Arizona, and floods in Colorado were vivid illustrations of this region's water volatility. The plants, wildlife, and people native to this region adapted over thousands of years to these conditions. But the fossils and ancient ruins found throughout the West remind us that long-term survival in deserts is not guaranteed. Despite living in a desert with various risks of scarce and unpredictable water supplies, here in Utah, as in most Western states, water has been made easily accessible. You can drink fresh water straight from a faucet. You can shower or bathe until you're wrinkled. You can humidify the air in your house or mist your patio on a hot day. You can install swimming pools, hot tubs, fountains, and other water features on your property. The cost of reliable and conveniently supplied water is generally so low that few people, when asked about their water, can tell you how much they pay for it, how much they use, or where it comes from. Western states continue to grow in population and to become more urbanized, and they have some of the fastest growing cities in the United States. But rapid growth in an arid region with unpredictable water supplies poses problems for policymakers, water managers, and citizens who are going to need to ask themselves how much water do we need to survive? And how much of our water uses could be considered wants instead of needs? So let's think about water needs and wants. A basic amount of water is needed to support life, which includes water to drink, water for food, and water for sanitation. Water to keep people alive is recognized as the highest societal priority and is given legal preference in times of drought. But when water is convenient and inexpensive, we also use it for things we want. Those amenities and lifestyle conveniences that support our lifestyles. The situation we face today in the Western US is that water needs and wants are increasing. Growing populations need more water for their basic survival. And because of its seemingly endless supply, people come to expect that water will continue to be available for all of their wants and needs. This expectation slowly transforms yesterday's water wants into tomorrow's water needs, resulting in even greater use and dependence on scarce supplies. In addition, scientists are finding that this region's water availability historically was even more limited and less reliable than previously thought. And the future holds additional unknowns related to climate change. Unfortunately, this is not a message that growing populations, expanding real estate markets, and revolving politicians in deserts want to hear. So cities in the Western US work hard to reverse these trends. They seek to expand the amount of water available and to reduce uses in order to regain the sense of security needed for continued growth. And so far, they've been fairly successful at pursuing this strategy. In order to expand water availability, 
Growing cities rely on scientists, engineers, lawyers, and managers to help them locate, transport, and utilize new sources of water, such as water from rural areas, water from underground aquifers, water transferred from other uses, or reclaimed water. Increasingly, growing cities are also trying to reduce water use by promoting greater efficiency, conservation, and reuse. This strategy generally buys time, allowing cities and citizens to ignore the longer-term uncertainties of living in a desert. However, here's the rub. Growing cities ultimately confront the fact that they're not the only ones who need and want the desert's scarce water. The West metropolitan areas are all pursuing the same strategy, trying to find more available water from untapped sources and distant areas and to secure it for their own use. In addition, humans are not the only species who need water for their survival. Other desert species need a basic amount of water to support life, which, as with people, includes water to drink, water for food, and water for a clean habitat. These species provide the most basic survival stories of all. When streams and wetlands dry, fish die, and birds and other wildlife migrate elsewhere. Let me share with you some examples from research that colleagues and I have done on how people in our area are trying to figure out how much water they need, which is often illuminated in times of drought. The examples involve three different types of irrigators who represent the largest uses vying for the West scarce water. Agriculture, the environment, and cities. <clears throat> the first example involves agricultural irrigators in the Bear River Basin of Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. The Bear River is very challenging to manage. The river is about 500 miles long and winds its way through rural areas in three states, crossing state boundaries five times and passing through several hydroelectric dams. The river is diverted to store and withdraw irrigation water in Bear Lake. As a result, this ecologically unique lake fluctuates. The river is governed by an intricate law that includes an interstate compact, court decrees, and state water laws that define, prioritize, and limit water uses. In 2004, the Bear River Basin suffered one of the most severe droughts in over a century. But much to their own surprise, water users avoided conflict. As their crops suffered, agricultural irrigators with the most senior rights voluntarily gave up storage water they had the legal right to use in order to raise the level of Bear Lake. They did so under a voluntary agreement signed after the previous drought by irrigators, the hydroelectric power company, and homeowners around Bear Lake. Implementation of this agreement was facilitated by river modeling and instrumentation that provided needed data and by twice weekly conference calls where users coordinated their water uses. But the underlying key to this successful drought response was rooted in a much longer process of people better understanding their own water needs in relationship to others' needs. They chose to cooperate as they realized their needs made them all vulnerable to water scarcity. The second example involves managers at the Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge, which is located at the Bear River's Delta in the Great Salt Lake and is an important part of the lake's internationally significant desert wetlands. 
Refuge managers have become wetland farmers, essentially flood irrigating refuge land to maintain habitat for waterfowl and migratory birds. They have built an extensive diversion and dike system to keep wetlands wet. This management strategy is an adaptation to general water scarcity, to their location at the end of a highly utilized river, and to refuge water rights that are junior to other rights. During droughts, refuge managers are forced to make difficult choices about which parts of the refuge will get water and which ones will have to go dry, knowing that they will meet the habitat needs of some birds, but not of others. <clears throat> they are working hard to understand how much water is needed to maintain healthy wetland ecosystems for the sake of the birds, but also because we're learning that these ecosystems provide humans with many important benefits in a highly coupled natural and human world. Interestingly, agricultural irrigators and wetland irrigators at the end of the Bear River have come to understand their mutual vulnerabilities to water scarcity and their shared interest in the open space needed to produce food for people and for wildlife. This understanding has led to often unexpected cooperation to help meet each other's water needs. The third example involves many of us, urban irrigators who water plants in our own yards. In many Western communities, 60 to 70% of the water is used outdoors to irrigate landscapes. Many of the plants used in those landscapes are not well suited to arid environments, and so they get very thirsty. And we have learned that urban irrigators are not always skilled at watering their lawns and gardens efficiently. It takes time and attention <clears throat> to learn the different water needs of grass versus other types of plants, to water landscapes appropriately for changes in the weather and seasons, and to ensure that automatic sprinkler systems are well designed, maintained, and operated to avoid waste. During droughts, urban irrigators are often encouraged to save water. They may have to water less frequently or pay a little more for water, but rarely is the actual amount of water they use curtailed. Since water conveniently comes directly to individual households, urban irrigators are less aware of and prepared to respond to the shared vulnerabilities of living with water scarcity. So several of us have developed an approach to map and illustrate whether residents at individual properties are using more water than their particular landscapes need as a way to help them achieve greater efficiency. This is particularly important in Utah, where rapidly growing communities of the Wasatch Front metropolitan area seek to obtain water from the Bear River Basin and from other areas dependent for their own survival on meeting rural and ecosystem needs. So what lessons can we learn from these irrigators who all depend on scarce water to grow plants in the landscapes of this arid region? <clears throat> First, we all make choices about water, and those choices have consequences. We are connected through water, and what we choose to do with it affects others. Sometimes the effects our choices have on others are easy to see, such as when agricultural irrigators can see the effects of their water use on Bear Lake property owners upstream or on wetlands of the Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge downstream. Other times, the consequences of our choices are less visible, such as when urban irrigators do not see waste from overwatering and do not recognize the effects that waste has on others. Knowing the consequences of our water choices can make us realize that we should not take water for granted and that we should exercise good stewardship in its use. 
The second lesson is that conflict over water is not inevitable, but it too is a choice. We can keep on chuckling over and accepting the assumptions behind Mark Twain's famous phrase that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. <clears throat> See, you chuckled. <laughs> or we can decide that water is too important in a desert and we can choose to cooperate so we can all survive together. The agricultural and wetland irrigators of the Bear River show us that the more people understand their shared reliance on water, the more willing they become to take other people's and nature's needs into account. Cooperation is also a choice that hinges on caring about water and caring about each other. The third lesson is that the best choices will not be easy choices. We can continue to pursue our present strategy of trying to stretch available water to meet increasing uses, but ultimately, water in arid regions of the West is limited for all species. It won't be easy, but it will be best to face that reality sooner rather than later. As we do so, the agricultural, wetland, and urban irrigators from our examples challenge us to think carefully about the larger landscape of all beneficial uses and the societal trade-offs we're willing to make. These examples illustrate that harmonizing the needs for water of different users can be achieved through local and cooperative approaches where choices become clearer as people understand the true value of water and how to share it fairly. Survival in arid regions of the Western US is not guaranteed. It depends on how we come to know and choose to act on the limits that scarce water ultimately imposes. The legacies of the choices we make will survive in the lives of future generations and in the landscapes of the West. Will we leave behind healthy ecosystems and sustainable communities? Or will we leave behind species extinctions and abandon homes? We have chosen to populate our desert regions. Now we must choose how to adapt and how to survive in them. Thank you.